Um, now I'll introduce the panel, and we're going to start with Julia Knorr from Davidson, who will be reporting on Community Care Sustains Imokali's Migrant Workers. This is in Florida, you will hear more. And Florence Middleton from Berkeley, After Birth. If that sounds mysterious, it won't in a few minutes. <laughs> and Asus Villalba from Westchester Community College, Healthcare for Aging Undocumented Workers. Next up is Leila God from Hunter College, Singapore, Aging Amidst a Heating Up World. And then we'll hear from Joy Tosakun from George Washington School of Public Health, Discrimination Towards Thai Transgender People. So thank you all, and I'll give this over to you. Hi, so my name is Julia Kinnear, and I am a Global Health and Equities Reporting Fellow this year, um, and I was a Davidson College 2020 Reporting Fellow. So my project is titled, Community Care Sustains Immokalee's Migrant Farm Workers. So just for a bit of context, um, Immokalee is an agricultural community in Florida, um, somewhat outside of Naples. Um, it's a majority um, Central American, Mexican, and Haitian farm workers, um, and many of the individuals who live in this community live below the federal poverty line. Um, in general, some of the conditions that people are facing are um, low wages and kind of unpredictable working conditions depending on the seasons. Um, there's a real lack of um, adequate housing. Um, a lot of people live in very um, overcrowded trailers and share um, their living space with strangers um, and have to move around frequently. Um, there's also a real lack of public transportation, so a lot of people have to walk um, or bike to get around. Um, and food prices are also generally very high. There's not a lot of um, fresh, affordable food. A lot of people rely on like small markets um, that they can walk to. Um, and this community has a very strong disparity with the county um, around it. So Collier County is one of the most, um, it's definitely one of the most unequal, but also um, has some of the wealthiest communities in Florida. So that's kind of the context in which this reporting is set. Um, so initially I wasn't um, uh, entirely sure which aspect of health I was going to focus on when I arrived in the community. I kind of went in with a really open mind um, to see what some of the most pressing issues were. And um, I knew that Immokalee had one of the highest rates of COVID during the pandemic. Um, I knew that there was um, kind of a lack of uh, adequate health care, but I wanted to kind of see what was most pressing to individuals when I got there. Um, so one of the main issues that I found was um, this prevalence of food insecurity and seeing how that um, tied to many different aspects of health and daily life. Um, so one of the kind of key connections I noticed was that there's a lot of economic insecurity in the community tied to the seasonal labor, to um, kind of just the different situations people were facing. And so this um, in turn contributed to food insecurity as well. Um, there's also, as I mentioned, not a ton of um, affordable, healthy food options that people can access. So there isn't even like a Walmart or a Target or anything in the area that might have like lower priced food. There is a Winn-Dixie is like the only kind of chain grocery store which is not known for having great like produce options, for example. And then there are small markets that tend to have um, much higher priced foods than you might find in um, like neighboring cities that are larger, for example. Um, so a lot of the food options that people can access are like fast food, and a lot of these are tied to um, more prevalent health conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, et cetera. Um, and a lot of people are not necessarily aware that the choices that they make in what they eat can also um, directly impact their like physical and mental health long term. Um, in addition, kind of being in this state of constant um, food insecurity for some can contribute to mental health concerns such as anxiety. Um, and so that's kind of another factor that I saw um, throughout my reporting. Um, and then lastly, because there is such a prevalent housing crisis, 
Um, and this housing that people do have tends to be like really expensive and really um, constrained in space. Um, this can limit individuals' abilities to like store food for their whole family to cook um, because they might be sharing a kitchen with like 15 other people. Um, and also landlords tend to be like really restrictive in what people are able to do. So it's difficult for people to always have gardens and especially also if they're moving around a lot. Um, so that was kind of the first uh, aspect that I really focused on in my reporting. Um, and then more recently I've done some follow-up reporting because there was legislation passed in um, May and went into effect in July that um, was tied to a number of aspects of daily life for undocumented immigrants in Florida. But one of the things that was um, really impactful was that um, hospitals that accept Medicaid um, started to have to ask for patients' immigration status on intake forms. And this was causing a lot of like fear and anxiety among community members in Immokalee because a lot of people are undocumented or live in mixed status families. Um, so there was a lot of like misinformation um, kind of circulating around the community because although this legislation was requiring hospitals to ask about status, it wasn't um, denying anyone care and it wasn't, um, although the the information was going to be reported to the state, it wasn't going to tie individuals' names to um, the status that they reported, but a lot of people were not aware of this. Um, so this was causing a lot of like kind of anxiety in general and was causing people to start to leave Florida, to um, be more hesitant to go to the hospital to get the care that they needed. Um, so essentially, I thought that it was really important to kind of follow up on this. Um, so in general, I really tried to focus on solutions and kind of the community response um, in my reporting. So there's a lot of nonprofit organizations that are working together to kind of provide support to community members, to educate people about um, different options. Um, there was a lot of like really innovative responses that I saw. So to food insecurity, people were foraging herbs that they found in their like home communities. They were having more kind of informal food exchanges. Um, and then there was a community outreach team run through the local federally uh, qualified health center where community health workers were going out into neighborhoods, knocking on doors, and speaking to people in their native languages to really build that trust and kind of mitigate misinformation. So in my reporting process, I really worked to build trust with community members and organizations. Um, I started by reaching out like in my pre-reporting to some of the organizations I found online. Um, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers is really well known for their long history of um, work to get more just labor conditions and human rights in the fields. Um, so I was able to get contacts and kind of get connections throughout the community um, in my pre-reporting, but I think spending time in the community, going out every day, kind of um, getting a more holistic view on community issues by speaking with people who lived there their whole lives, doing continuous follow-ups so I wasn't just speaking to somebody once, but really kind of following up throughout my whole process. Um, was really important. And then lastly, being able to interview people in Spanish and publish in Spanish um, was really important as well. So I'll just briefly kind of give an overview. I ended up publishing my food insecurity story in Civil Eats and a Spanish version in the Spanish edition of the Miami Herald um, because these felt like they really fit the food insecurity story that I worked on. Um, and then I was able to do a follow-up. Um, Civil Eats was doing a feature on like food, the food safety net and they wanted an interview with the farm workers. So I was able to kind of go back to one of my sources to get a contact to look into that. Um, and then for my kind of follow-up story on um, like healthcare access and this new legislation, um, I published in the Harvard Public Health Magazine because this seemed like a really good fit for that story. Um, and then I had also a number of field notes that were kind of more reflections on my experiences. I did a photo essay. I was just talked about going out into the community, attending a community meeting, um, kind of a bit more in-depth look at that process. And that's it. Hi everyone, my name is Florence Middleton. I'm at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism and my story is mysteriously after birth and um, I'm in my pre-reporting stage and so I am planning to do my reporting trip next month in November. 
It was really important to me to do a story about postpartum health in America because the postpartum experience is the most ignored stage of the pregnancy journey. We see and hear a lot about pregnancy and we know a lot about birth, but postpartum, the one year following birth, is different. Let me give you an example. In 2022, a company selling postpartum products made a commercial about their products that help new mothers recover. They made this commercial for the Oscars, and I want to show it to you. It's just one minute long. For, excuse me, for me as a new mom myself, seeing this was incredibly refreshing and incredibly relatable. Before I gave birth, I had never seen anything like this before, and going through the experience myself was a very surprising experience. But the commercial never aired because the Oscars banned it, considering it too graphic to show. We don't see the postpartum period, and we don't talk about it, and on top of that, healthcare in America supporting mothers postpartum is insufficient. And we know this because in 2022, just last year, the CDC released data about pregnancy-related births, excuse me, pregnancy-related deaths. So we know that deaths related to pregnancy happen during pregnancy. And we also know that they happen during birth itself. But what I was really surprised to learn was that the vast majority of deaths related to pregnancy actually happen postpartum. And it's not just the one or two days following birth, and it's not just the one or two months following birth. It's actually the full 365 days following birth. Despite this, someone who is pregnant receives an average of 15 medical checkups if they have a healthy pregnancy. But after birth, only one. So what is America doing about this? First, let me say that um, almost half of pregnant, or excuse me, half of births that take place in the US are actually covered by Medicaid. And for folks who are not familiar with Medicaid, it's the U.S.'s health insurance that's offered to people who qualify as low income to make sure that they have health insurance coverage if they can't afford it themselves. Um, in 2023, this year, the U.S. federal government gave states the option to permanently extend Medicaid health care coverage from just two months to 12 months. So what this means is that if you were someone who was low income, you may have given birth, and you may have had health complications, and you may reach two months after birth and lose access to your health insurance, meaning there's a huge gap in your care. After, this, after the federal government gave states this option to extend their coverage, Medicaid coverage, to a full year, all states made a commitment to extend um, to 12 months, or some version of it, except for three. Idaho, Iowa, and Arkansas. My story focuses on Arkansas. And the reason why I decided to focus on Arkansas is because not only did Arkansas decide to not extend their Medicaid postpartum health coverage to a year, they also, according to the CDC's most recent data, have the highest rate of maternal mortality in the US. 
on top of that, plus Roe v. Wade, they also have decided to make the majority, the vast majority of abortions illegal, which many believe will increase maternal mortality. So as I mentioned, I'm doing my reporting trip um, next month, and um, I have been able to find a new mother who lost her Medicaid after giving birth, who's open to speaking with me. I've been doing interviews with uh, maternal health experts and advocates, as well as community organizations who are supporting postpartum mothers. Um, I am a photojournalist, and so in addition to my article for the Pulitzer Center, I'm excited to add a robust uh, photo essay, so I'm looking forward to going there, showing who this mother is and what her life is like, as well as the areas that are considered maternal um, health deserts throughout Arkansas. I'm looking forward to connecting with the community organizations to show what efforts they're doing. I'm also hoping to interview the um, Republican representative who um, proposed the bill to extend postpartum health, uh, Medicaid postpartum health coverage to 12 months that bill that failed, um, and I'm also uh, hoping to interview the head of the Maternal Mortality Committee, um, the board there, um, that's looking at the problem in Arkansas. And so, um, to end the presentation, um, I hope that you leave this wondering why. Why this? Why not this? And why here? And what can we do to make it better. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is he uh, Jesus Vialba, and uh, my project is a documentary specifically reporting on uh, aging undocumented workers. Um, I've also, uh, so in terms of where I'm at in the process, um, I am still in the production process and still trying to schedule interviews and stuff. Uh, so today I won't be able to show you sort of like where I'm at in terms of the documentary, but um, I'll be sharing kind of what I've learned from this project. Uh, and kind of where it's headed in terms of where the story has shifted from what I originally proposed. Uh, <clears throat> uh, okay, so I guess like for context, um, um, it's helpful to start with sort of like federal policy. What's the federal policy when it comes to uh, how healthcare is managed uh, across the country? Um, so one of the things I'll be focusing on in, in the story is, is uh, looking at the most recent um, big federal policy that hap has happened in, in recent history, which was the Affordable Care Act. Um, and so uh, the goal of the Affordable Care Act was to increase uh, the number of people with health insurance uh, in the US. Um, there was a lot of um, sort of things that went into it. Uh, and. But one of the other things that they wanted to do was also to increase, uh, to reduce the cost of preventative care uh, for Medicare recipients. And so Medicare is um, sort of a policy from uh, during the, the New Deal, uh, which seeks to create a, a security net for aging people in the US. Uh, so as the policy went, the federal policy went through, um, nearly 20 million people were able to gain um, health coverage. Um, uh, and so that was accomplished. Uh, the federal policy when it comes to everybody excludes undocumented people from um, those kinds of um, resources. <clears throat> so there is a, a sort of gap of, cover of health coverage um, across the country for specifically undocumented uh, people. And uh, it's estimated um, at approximately 10 million undocumented people across the US. There are approximately 10 million people across the US. Uh, that, those estimates are, I mean, that's a whole issue that we'll get to towards the end about um, how to gather data on a population that's high risk. Um, and so that's coming up in sort of like the research. Um, and so what ends up happening, because there is this 
gap of, of, of where resources can be allocated, uh, states uh, are able to provide their own sort of state subsidized programs to sort of uh, meet that gap. Um, and this, of course, becomes an issue when you have public health crises like the recent uh, COVID-19 um, health crises. Um, and so uh, states with large, a lot of states with high uh, immigration populations have sought to um, think of innovative ways of introducing uh, state subsidized health coverage to, to meet that gap of uncovered individuals. Um, and so New York, New York State is one, uh, Colorado is another state, uh, California is actually one of the more, has, has been sort of a, a leader of sorts in terms of that in a state level innovation. Um, and so um, recently in July of 22, uh, California was able to have the most uh, state subsidized coverage for undocumented people uh, called Medi-Cal. Um, and so um, New York State is trying to sort of follow uh, California's lead from a legislative perspective. Um, and so part of what's coming up in the story is the story has become also about this uh, New York State's sort of journey in trying to um, use um, a waiver, a federal waiver to, to use uh, federal money to sort of also uh, fund state subsidized uh, health care. <clears throat> The, um, one of the surprising things in the research, uh, and this is data from uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center, um, was that uh, because of the trends of immigration, uh, there used to be historically migration uh, could, was easier, and so you would have populations come in, and then seasonally they would leave, and then come in and leave. As um, immigration policy became more restrictive following the immigration reform laws of the 90s, uh, and then later followed by um, post 9-11 policy. Um, that has created a situation where uh, there's a lot, of un a lot of people who are undocumented have, are sort of stuck in the US uh, because uh, it's too risky to go back, and so there's a, a, a sort of like, uh, a population here that's aging and uh, isn't like there aren't new immigrants coming in, um, and so what you have is that th this population that's stuck here is aging at a faster rate. Not individuals are aging at a faster rate, but just sort of like the the segment of the population. Uh, and so some of the data here uh, just shows a comparison between. Uh, native-born population and undocumented population, or Im uh, yeah, immigrants and foreign-born populations. Um, and so you s we see here that actually most of the people that migrated in the 90s are reaching their sort of uh, retirement age, is what they call it. Uh, but also um, undocumented people don't really have the safety net to retire. And so these are people who are working into their uh, into that age. That means that they're also in need of more comprehensive health coverage, actually. Um, so to also just give a, a context on what's happening sort of with this population. Um, so there's uh, a lot of factors, there's a lot of compounding vulnerabilities uh, that are at play for, uh, for this population that's aging. So it's, it's got a high rate of occupational injuries uh, because of the type of, uh, types of jobs that undocumented people take on. Um, you know, domestic workers, uh, uh, domestic work is one of those jobs and so there's uh, extended exposure to cleaning chemicals. Uh, there's also, uh, in New York City in particular, uh, bike, de bike delivery workers tend to be undocumented and have a high injury rate. Um, there's the fear, a lot of like the sort of restrictive immigration policy uh, sort of um, has, there's a lot of fear in terms of any kind of interaction with medical or just reporting any kind of um, work-related hazard. Um, so a lot of, there's a lot of underreported 
um, sort of data. Um, medical attention as is is cost prohibitive and being undocumented also just even if there are programs where you could get some kind of health care um, it's very uh, difficult to access because of the fear of interacting with any kind of uh, you know authority or things of that sort um, and so that just that all those factors sort of also come together into a situation where as workers are aging they also um, are more susceptible to those kinds of injuries. Um, so um, in, in, in sort of the documentary, I was, I've been able to follow this group of um, uh, organizers who are, are, are working with legislative uh, bodies to try to like pass more uh, comprehensive coverage for undocumented people specifically. And also, and they're very um, sort of, um, aware of that, that there is an aging population that, whose needs are not being met. Uh, so this uh, is at a, at a rally in front of Albany where a lot of uh, people were sharing their story and Celine's story I thought was, is one of uh, many um, stories that are similar. So Celine is a domestic worker and so um, during the, she had to work during the COVID-19 uh, quarantine period. Um, and um, she contracted COVID-19 because her employers allowed uh, infected family members to come in and out of the house while she was there cleaning. And so with no safety net to fall on, uh, she, had, she had to sort of work through that and then go home and risk exposing family members. Um, and so there, this was an interesting sort of story because uh, <clears throat> the thing that came out during that time was this term of essential workers. And, um, but as, as essential as they are, uh, there's no sort of sa safety net and to provide any essential kind of services that they need, so. So I think one of the more challenging things about this story is that there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there's not a, 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 um, a, it's very difficult to get data. There's not a single place that has sort of like the go-to stats on undocumented population. Uh, two um, two um, research bodies are the community service, uh, I have it here. Uh, there's two independent uh, policy research uh, groups that have made it, that ha sort of uh, created a lot of helpful data on undocumented pop populations. Uh, the Community Service Society and the Kaiser Family Foundation are independent sort of research groups. Um, and there's also, in my research, I came across uh, uh, the director of faculty research at the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Institute. Uh, it's Dr. Arturo Vargas Bustamante, who I'm hoping to interview, um, who actually has made a department specifically for studying undocumented populations and their health needs. Um, and so the reason for why it's difficult, it's because it's a very high risk uh, uh, population and a lot of the recent policy has been very punitive. Uh, one example is that in 2019, um, during that time there was, um, uh, uh, the Department of Homeland Security sought to um, use public charge, uh, which is a, 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 um, their policy on punishing even green card holders uh, for seeking any kind of services. So this, this situation created a lot of fear from anybody, including people who, are, who do have status. And that has uh, further generated sort of a culture of fear for um, undocumented workers. Um, and so what that creates too is also a further uh, invisibility of this community. Um, and so now, I guess in my work uh, as documentarian, because it's such a heavy visual f f medium, um, I'm also having a challenge in terms of um, the ethics around uh, portrayal and how responsible, responsible it is to, to sort of be adamantly have a visual, you know, have a visual human story. So I'm sort of at a point where I'm trying to look at different formats to complete the story because I do feel like it is important to make uh, this situation visible at a human level. At the same time, 
the visual portrayal, the physical portrayal of people might be risky. So, um, so the last thing uh, is, thank you. Uh, that's all. Thank you. That's all I have time for. <laughs> Please ask me questions. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Layla Gad. Uh, as I was saying before, I'm a senior at Hunter College, and I haven't done my reporting yet, so today I'm really excited to share with you um, a topic that I find uh, very important, and it's on the forefront, and I think that more people need to be talking about this. So uh, the title of my project is Aging Amidst a Heating Up World, um, and I'm planning to explore how Singapore's older adult population copes with heat. So, I mean, how many of us, like, last summer, you know, sweating when you're going to work, you're like, I don't even want to go to work right now, I'm sweating, my makeup's, like, falling off, like, I feel like a mess. But it's true, the world is getting hotter. It's, you're not the only one, like, experiencing this. Um, NASA reported that just last year, 2022, we had our last anomaly where the world temperature was 1.6 uh, degrees Fahrenheit hotter than usual. Um, and over the last century, scientists has, has estimated that the Earth's global temperature has gradually increased by two degrees Celsius. Um, and this increase in heat is not felt equally across the world. Um, areas that are cities, so like if you, lived, if you live in Phoenix, Arizona, or if you live in New York City, those kind of cities experience heat uh, more rapidly than other places. And in specific for me, Singapore, which is a tropical, you know, uh, island near the equator, they experience heat much faster than we do. Um, so, <clears throat> so as I was saying before, uh, Singapore is located in, you know, around Southeast Asia. Um, I'll put a box so you guys can see it. 20% uh, of heat-related death events uh, worldwide between 2000 to 2019 occur in East Asia. Um, Singapore right here is a small island. It's almost the size of New York City and has a comparable um, population and Singapore officials report that uh, the city-state is increasing in heat three times faster than the rest of the world and urban heat so let's dive into why areas like Singapore or cities like as, as I was mentioning before experience heat faster than other areas so they're typically called urban heat islands and they experience temperature increases one to seven degree uh, Fahrenheit higher than neighboring areas like suburbs, that's because all of the temperature gets locked into the cement and it doesn't really get to, all the heat gets locked into the cement and it doesn't really get to bounce back up or, uh, you know, get uh, absorbed into the green space. So here, uh, Singapore reports that uh, the highest uh, temperatures are felt in the central region, which is where I'm planning to go. Um, Sorry, my slides were different from what I planned, but it's okay. Um, so the Singapore government reports that, uh, that uh, older adults um, are experiencing heat more rapidly in uh, Singapore than in other, uh, si uh, than other populations in the country. Um, uh, and that's also a, a really big problem um, because older adults are, the, Singapore is planning to be um, one of the super age countries where older adults make up one out of five people are above 65 years old. As you can see here, um, by 2030, uh, Singapore plans, uh, is aiming to have around 23.8% of its population to be older than the age of 65. So older adults are amongst the most vulnerable when it comes to rising heat temperatures. So the reason I chose Singapore was, as I was saying before, they're in between this precip like they're at this nexus between um, heat, rising heat, and rising older adult populations. But they do have really innovative initiatives planned. Um, one of them is called the Green Plan's key target, uh, the Green Plan, and their key targets is to plant one million more trees. Uh, they're planning to quadruple solar energy deployment by 2025. You know, reduce waste sent to landfills by 30 percent. Uh, by 2030, at least 20% of schools are to be carbon neutral. Um, right now, currently, Singapore is made up of 46% of green space, which is comparative to places like New York City that only have 20%. Um, additionally, they have really amazing infrastructure, uh, something called sky, uh, sky rise greening, which is, has, has 
led to 30% of a, a cooling impact in, this, in the city state. Um, and Singapore views trees as infrastructure, not design. And I make this distinction because in places where I'm from, like New York City, trees are seen as design or ornaments. They're seen as beautifying. And when you live in a place where there's so many different kind of cultures, views on trees can be different because of this beautifying element that it's given. So to some people, trees may not be beautifying because people put up their garbage on the bark, uh, on the on the trunks, and that makes the uh, exterior of their of their homes unpleasant. Or to some people, they see that we don't have parks because we live in disadvantaged areas, so we need the stoop to stoop to play basketball. Um, so Singapore's view on trees as infrastructure and not design is um, very interesting and important and one of the reasons why I chose Singapore as a place, as my destination. Um, so how does Singapore's older adult population cope with the heat? So is it via AC? Like most of us, we use AC or we go on walks. Actually, CNN reports that 99% of private housing in Singapore has an AC. However, only 15% of public housing units have it. And in doing some deeper research, I found that 80% of older adults live in public housing. They don't have access to private housing. So they don't have access to an AC. Um, and then the financial burden of using an AC also makes it harder for these older adults to um, find different climate ad uh, adaptations. Uh, another thing is that S uh, Singaporean older adults do feel a little bit afraid to open up their windows or open up their doors to let cooling in um, due to just safety concerns. So. Even though Singapore is really safe, I've actually found some articles that have said that these older adults feel afraid to open up their windows and they just resort to taking five to six showers a day. So my project plan, I'm planning to go to Tiang Bahru um, and I've been speaking to researchers at the Duke uh, Medical School <coughs> to um, interview some older adults there. I really want to uh, do a feature story on one older adult on how they experience heat in Singapore. As I was saying before, um, Singapore is at this night, at this intersection where their older adult population is getting larger and heat is getting higher. And um, unlike other climate related events, I found that heat is hard to visualize because it doesn't have devastating effects visually like let's say a hurricane or a rainstorm. So, um, when it comes to heat, it's hard to show the devastation that heat, uh, uh, um, sorry, devastation that heat uh, brings to older adult populations because it can get nuanced as to why, you know, was it really a heat stroke or did it just pr uh, provoke an underlying condition? Um, so just the last point that I want to make is that while I'm not exactly sure how we can visually present heat in the future in news, um, uh, articles, one thing that I really just want to emphasize is that these lonely deaths that older adults experience in their homes and in their apartments need to be, uh, a raise awareness needs to be brought to them and we need to talk more about this idea of uh, lonely deaths due to heat. Thank you. Um, so my name is Joy and my reporting project is on discrimination towards Thai transgender people and the impact on transgender health. So a little bit of background, um, transgender people are highly visible in Thai society, yet they are discriminated against and they lack basic human rights, health rights uh, compared to their cisgender counterparts. And there is a law in Thailand, um, it's called the Gender Protection Act of 2015. and you know, that's just like unlawful discrimination against people based on their gender identity. However, it's not being implemented well and there's no punishment if that does happen. So technically it's almost like there's no law. Um, and then these are some of the people I interviewed. So I went throughout different parts of Thailand just to ask them about um, their access to healthcare, their experience to healthcare and ways to improve um, whatever they're like, they've been feeling discrimination, stigma. And I also was able to in, um, interview the president of the Thai Transgender Alliance Group um, and the manager of um, the first ever transgender clinic in Thailand called uh, Tangerine Clinic. And that clinic is um, community led. So like it's just, it's being led by transgender people. 
Um, so there is a chain reaction um, that you know I saw from these interviews, and everyone that I interviewed said that they experienced some sort of bullying or teasing at a very young age. And the president of the uh, Thai Transgender Alliance uh, Group, TGA, um, they said that from the bullying, there's an increased likelihood of not finishing school. And then that leads to a lower chances of getting a higher paying job or a stable job. And these people, um, they might go into um, work that's like day-to-day -day pay. So that can be uh, cabaret show performers. Um, one of the person that I interview was a cabaret show performer or a merchant. Um, and not all, but a lot are in um, the sex work industry. And from there, it kind of funnels it down to not being able to afford or access healthcare. And in Thailand, there is universal healthcare, but for public hospitals, and that's just to meet your basic health needs. So if you get sick, if you need minor stitches, you can go to a public hospital and you don't have to pay. But for gender affirming care, so just getting consulting for hormone use or gender reassignment surgery, you can't do that at a public hospital and it will cost you money or you need um, additional insurance. And so now, in terms of stigma and discrimination in um, the healthcare setting, so there is a lack of comprehensive healthcare services and gender affirming care for trans people. So, comprehensive healthcare services is when you go in and um, you can get screening, you can get surgery, you can get tested, you can get treatment all at once. You don't have to go to different places. And gender-affirming care is pretty much a patient-centered care and treatment that aligns a patient's um, physical trait with their gender identity. So the Tantric Clinic, they're one of few um, comprehensive healthcare, like, healthcare services providers in Thailand, but that's in the metropolitan area in Bangkok. So if you want that type of service, you would have to like fly into the city or, um, and like some people are not able to afford that type of treatment. And um, medical students in Thailand are not being taught gender affirming care as well. Like just the basic thing um, with engaging with patients, using the right pronouns, um, that's not being taught. You can take it as an elective, but it's not in the curriculum. And also everyone who I, in, like everybody I interviewed, they said that they, are, they have been misgendered at least once in a healthcare setting. So this is like an example of a Thai ID, it's just like my ID. Um, and so you have your uh, prefix, miss or mister, and in Thailand you can't change that, unlike here in the States. Um, so if you are you know, a trans woman, your ID, it's gonna have mister in it. So if you have mister in your ID, you are going to be put in a male ward in a public hospital. And for a person who feels like they are a woman, they, it might be very uncomfortable for them to be with in a room full of just like, you know, male. So that leads to that uncomfortable experience of healthcare facilities and providers. Um, and they might not be, able, like they might not engage in healthcare access or get treatment later on because of this negative experience. <clears throat> and that leads to like more stigma. So people like transgender people, um, they have, you know, that stigma against them in terms of like the HIV setting. And they might not go get more screening and more testing and that prevalence of HIV is still going to be high. And so there needs to be some change. And so when I was interviewing um, people, um, they also invited me to this press release for the Three Miracle Law. And it's, um, you know, it's, it talked about legal gender recognition, marriage equality bill, and uh, decriminalization of sex workers. And all of these are very applicable for transgender people. So in terms of marriage equality, there's, you know, same-sex marriage is not legal in Thailand. And if you're a transgender person and you have um, um, a partner who is also a male and you get into an accident, that person can't sign off for you at a hospital if something were to happen to you. And gender recognition, as mentioned, is very important. Um, and as mentioned before, a lot of um, transgender people, not all, um, are in sex work and there's no law protecting them in terms of like violence that are being committed like against them. And Another thing um, that 
um, the manager of the clinic and um, president of TJ mentioned that we need gender affirming care um, and we need to teach it in medical schools and having that accessible and affordable care, not just in the metropolitan area, but also in more rural settings. Um, so that way these people don't have to travel so far and feel that they can also get the same treatment as a cisgender person. And so my takeaway is that um, human rights are the foundation for advancing healthcare for all populations um, without the basic you know, rights of accessing care, of being called the right pronoun. Um, you just can't get like the same health care. People won't feel comfortable. Also, cultural context matters. Um, I have worked with um, transgender individuals um, in research in clinical settings. And being in Thailand is different than the US setting in terms, not just um, the transgender experience, but also the healthcare system. And also something that may seem small to us may not be small to others. So we are like so used to being like, oh yeah, I'm a female, like I use miss, but for them, they can't change it, but it makes them feel like there's some part of them that's missing every single day. And that's like, we should, you know, advocate for um, everyone who wants this type of change. Thank you. You all did a terrific job. Those were five excellent presentations, so thank you. And now I'd like to turn this over to you, and we'll start with Rajvi. And uh, we're asking people to stand up. Yeah, congratulations to all the panelists. Like, you picked really great topics. Oh, uh, Rajvi, uh, Columbia. So uh, I have a question for Florence and then a comment slash question for Jesus. So Florence, um, you know, I really love your presentation. Um, it, yeah, like, I wanted to understand, you know, like the thing that you said in the last bit, like I hope that you take away the question why, and that's like sitting with me a lot. So I wanted to understand like your plan or your thinking about how you're gonna go about explaining the why, like how deep you're gonna go into, I, let's say the demographics of the state or the state legislature or the historical context, whatever, like how are you planning to kind of explain the why and what has your pre-reporting interviews kind of, you know, drudged up, yeah. And then I get, can I hold on to it? Yeah. Hold it down. Now? Yeah. Um, thanks so much, Rajvi, for that question. I think it's incredibly important, and a couple of things come to mind immediately. Um, I think one, um, actually three things. Um, the why is incredibly important, and I think, yeah, the three things that kind of come to mind are, um, are race, um, the maternal medical desert and political motivation. And so um, to race, I think it's absolutely something to look at. And I think when you look at any kind of medical statistics, you can see that um, systemic racism disproportionately impacts people of color and particularly black women and black people who are giving birth. In Arkansas in particular, um, close to 20% of the population is black and um, close to 40% of the maternal deaths that are happening um, are, are uh, people of color. And so I think that's something I definitely want to explore and to understand and to highlight as a reason why. Um, medical desert, so 50% of, of Arkansas's counties are medical deserts, which means that they don't have access to hospitals or um, OBGYNs or birthing clinics where they can safely give birth. And so I think that's something, especially visually, I wanna explore and show that this is also a problem is access. And then um, third, uh, political motivation. And so um, <clears throat> I was speaking to someone recently, we were like, you know, maternal health is a pretty, uh, uh, simple thing. It seems like wouldn't most people want um, better care for for folks who are giving birth for um, mothers? But it's more complicated in the U.S. because, especially when you look at Medicaid, um, not all individuals are supportive of kind of growing government and free services and have a lot of perspectives on who deserves care and access. And so I think those are some of the whys that I want to dig into and explore and to speak with people further on. 
Thank you. Uh, good luck. I can't wait for you to execute this. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and yeah, another uh, kind of comment for Jesus. Uh, I really resonate with the ethical dilemma that you're facing uh, with you know your documentary. I really believe that exposure and awareness is not always a blanket good thing when it comes to certain communities. So yeah, I was just wondering like why, like what is your thinking behind it being a documentary um, versus, I mean, I understand what you're saying about humanizing the issues and perhaps not text, but what about maybe like an audio story versus a visual story? Like, I just want to understand like, you know, how, how you're thinking about these decisions, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. No, yeah, that's definitely, um, I had a conversation yesterday about specifically uh, audio format as actually like maybe something that could be helpful in a way because uh, yeah the so part of what I was initially try, the way that I was trying to problem solve on a document in the documentary format was I was trying to sort of not show faces but then that almost had the opposite effect of dehumanizing because it's just hands and that's been a thing that's been done um, but uh, actually from the from the uh, audio uh, project, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm blanking on names, but I thought that, that was an interesting format because um, it is there is something sort of personal, more personable and intimate about that format. Uh, that you know, uh, there is a human connection in that way that doesn't re uh, rely on face, on having a face to it. Um, so I, I've been, yes, yeah, it's been since that conversation yesterday. I've been thinking about the audio format and. Uh, and then just thinking of ways to include other visuals. So yeah, thanks. I would love to talk more. <laughs> okay, great questions. And I think Marina has one. Hello, everyone, and congratulations on those wonderful uh, presentations. I'm Marina from the Pulitzer Center team. I wanted to ask each of you maybe quickly if you want to share how you're thinking about your audience and what are the audiences that most need to see, read, engage with your story. Um, and how that might influence your choice of distribution. Um. Oh, okay, sorry. Sorry, techno technology difficulty. Um, yeah, I, I've been thinking about this, and I think that, especially when it comes to my story, when I introduce it as a climate health based story, e aging and heat, sometimes the connection can be lost. And I do have to sit down and like explain, like here's how all of these th things, three things connect. Um, but the main reason why I wanted to tell this story was that I think that it's older adults lack the climate literacy of how to handle a heat wave related event. So I really wanted the piece to be sort of like an informational piece for them where they can see themselves in the story. It's not sort of like a younger person, you know, like whole intergenerational connection. Like I want to show that this is you and you've experienced this before and here's how you go about protecting yourself from experiencing a heat wave. So I, I've really just seen this story as like a climate literacy sort of angle. Um, and of course I've thought about like, how should I distribute it because you know, um, Older adults typically like to, you know, read more things that are on paper and, um, but I thought that maybe something uh, visual or audio would be best because it's something that could listen, they could listen to or they could watch and it doesn't, ha they don't have to worry about the text on the website not being large enough. Um, but yeah, thanks, good question. Um, so when thinking about this, I like want to my audience is more of like the medical professional side of things, hopefully to promote that collaboration since there is no gender affirming care in Thailand, the collaboration with like, you know, physicians from other countries that do have like gender affirming care, um, promoting that and also just being able to create that more awareness of like the different like gen transgender experience compared like to the US, that's all. Um, yeah, I've definitely have um, been thinking about audience a lot. I think um, I go, I sort of go back and forth in terms of um, who has the power in, to, in a legislative way, and at the same time also recognize that that so much of the the fear uh, that sort of that is part of the issue 
um, makes me almost want to also in the same vein have this project because it's a documentary be, uh, be for sort of undocumented people who, who, who can learn about how the policy works because there is a lot of misinformation as um, uh, Julia's uh, project mentioned ab about uh, what what a, when policy is made I think just to say like the, res the response is to to not interact with um, any kind of like institution um, and I used to be undocumented myself and so um, it's interesting to sort of um, continue to to see that there's this like fear and it, it, there's it's just there's no uh, there's no stable position in terms of like in, in terms of legislation so I think a, a documentary project that could help um, other um, undocumented people understand sort of the more of the policy end of things is also kind of where I'm gearing towards but um, in terms of audience I'm this is a little bit of a generic answer but I'm thinking as broadly as possible I feel like it's important for people who are not just folks who are giving birth to have an understanding and awareness and care for um, people who are giving birth and the health complications that do arise um, I do hope that it can be a story that's beyond Arkansas. It is kind of a problem across the US and I'm using Arkansas and Medicaid to really highlight the issue, but I do think that it's um, something that really uh, permeates across all states and all people. And so even though I am focusing in on Arkansas, I hope it can be distributed more broadly. And also policymakers. I feel like there's just a huge need for um, an advancement of policy and healthcare practices to support um, new moms, and uh, that's that's my hope. And in terms of like actual platform and where, um, I don't know yet. And if anyone has ideas, would love to hear. Um, yeah, so I guess my case is a little bit different since I've already published my stories, but um, I guess in general, I ended up um, publishing in outlets that had a national reach, but a thematic focus. So I think that um, the reach was important because Immokalee is a community that doesn't receive a lot of attention in the news in general. Um, and the attention that it has received is generally surrounded around um, like the co Coalition of Immokalee Workers, which does really important work, but doesn't focus so much on some of the other um, actions that are happening in the community. Um, and so I thought it was really important to kind of um, have that broad reach, but um, the first piece that I did on food insecurity, I chose to publish with Civil Eats because that is kind of like the focus of their platform. Um, and the article focused a lot on some of the solutions that um, are really innovative in the community. There's like a really unique community garden that's drawing the community together. And I thought some of those strategies might also be relevant to other people interested in kind of a similar um, area. So that was kind of how I ended up with that. But I also thought that it would be really important for especially one of my main sources who shared like a lot of her personal story to be able to read the piece. Um, I felt like kind of having that full circle with the community and not just like going in and leaving and not kind of following through um, was something that I felt was really important. So I went back and asked like what outlets um, the people like that I interviewed would want to see this in if it was published in Spanish. And so that's kind of how I landed on doing that as well. Um, and then the second um, story that I did on like the legislation, um, uh, Harvard Public Health Magazine uh, publishes on kind of a lot of different issues related to um, like healthcare access in general. And so I felt like this would be a good fit and this kind of definitely had a different audience, like maybe a bit more um, in the academic world or just kind of like people who might not be um, as like it's definitely different than like a local news model, which is like where kind of a lot of the attention towards this legislation has been. So I thought that it was important to kind of show rather than just like this legislation is happening, but really showing kind of more of like the human um, community centered impacts that are like taking place right now at this point since it passed. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Simeon. Hardly from Southern Illinois University. I have two quick questions, one for Florence and one for Jesus. Uh, for Florence to start off, um, bouncing off what the question was just asked, your target audience. So since you are doing it on uh, birth and postpartum, I feel like that's a very, it's not a niche subject, but it is targeted to women. And a lot of times I feel like 
uh, things like that is often like shied away and ignored. So how are you gonna go by trying to get that to a broader audience? And in your story, since it is focused on postpartum women, are you gonna be foc Are you gonna try to get like some sources uh, that's male? And uh, how are you gonna try to reach an audience politically wise, political wise? I think that's the question. Yeah, thank you. I'm still trying to formulate my thoughts, so it may not come out very yeah. articulately. Um, I, um, I, I think I'm just hoping that the the depth of the issue is enough to motivate folks. I feel like in terms of who I want to interview, um, one of the one of the um, uh, one of the doctors on the maternal mortality review committee in Arkansas is male, and so he's um, there are two people I, I've been kind of reaching out to for interviews. So I'm hoping I might be able to connect with him, and um, so perhaps that would um, contribute to broadening the audience and um, folks hearing that perspective. Um, and I think I'm just kind of personally a believer that like when I see data like these that show it's such an enormous issue and then highlighting the fact that half of the population um, goes through postpartum experience that that is motivating because we definitely do need all people to help move things forward and not just rely on women. Um, but that's something that I'm gonna think about and um, kind of uh, consider um, because I, I uh, am unsure if others will feel as motivated as I do just from the data, so thank you. I love the story and I'm glad you're doing it. And for Jesus, uh, since you have a background, uh, since your background, uh, I think, I'm trying to word this correctly, uh, ethic or like race-wise, uh, is targeted to your the people that you're doing the story on. I feel like that's important. Uh, I'm a black man, so uh, doing stories on black people, I feel like uh, adds to the story because it gives a comfort, the uh, layer that's put down. Uh, so how has your background uh, helped you connect with the people uh, that you're doing a story on? Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. And, um yeah, I mean, I was formerly undocumented, so I think I'm, uh, yeah, I've, I've sort of had, had to navigate uh, accessing resources uh, that are alternative resources that are not sort of like um, official, like health or things like that. Um, so I think um, from that end, um, yeah, I think it's been, um, I'm, I'm attuned to um, what what's at risk and what, what um, how loaded a question can be. Um, and so I think I've been, for the most part, though, in this, in, in my stage, I've been mostly um, focused on policy right now. Um, but I have been involved in sort of like advocacy for, for uh, with um, there's a um, a coalition uh, called Coverage for All campaign, and so I've been involved with them. Um, and so um, that's my sort of also context for for um, how I sort of became aware of this specific disc discrepancy in terms of coverage. Um, so, so yeah, I think I guess the, the other thing that comes up, at least in New York, in the coalition in New York, uh, is a, a, a mostly Spanish-speaking pop, um, you know, group of advocates, so uh, I can do English or Spanish and have gotten Spanish interviews and I can easily translate and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, I guess in that sense I'm embedded in the issue deeply, um, and I think it's also why it's challenging to that I'm overthinking some of the format for the sort of requirement of having a, a human or a character uh, be part of the story. So, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, and I I think we're going to have to stick to our schedule. So I just want to thank everyone, not only the panelists but also all of you, for these great questions.